All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. So good to see everyone here. This is an awesome place. So great to be here. Woohoo! <laughs> um, I haven't met most of you. I've met quite a few people, especially online. Um, I'm John Cleveland Host. I look forward to meeting everyone here. And I'll be talking this morning on uh, family holidays, holidays in general, specifically about the Wheel of the Year. So um, I'll go through it. Yeah, Mark. Um, I wanted, John got here late last night, and I wanted to let everybody know that John is also on the Ethiopian Haven Society Council. So he's a, an active volunteer. All right, just a, just a quick, just a quick overview. Um, how many uh, people have been um, celebrating at least some of the holidays of the Wheel of the Year for more than a year? All right, more than five years. All right. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'll briefly touch on my story. Um, I certainly have not been celebrating all of the holidays of the Wheel of the Year my entire life, so um, that's quite common. Okay, so get started. Um, yeah, I'll be talking about the holidays, and so here we go. Okay, big question, why, right? Why celebrate holidays? Why take time? Why take money? Why take preparation and stress and all that kind of stuff, right? It's a pretty big question. The short answer is for the fun of it. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. I, I, I've had wonderful times with holidays, and I have to say, as a parent, I've had times where it was a huge pain. And, and so when you're in that kind of space, remember, you know, this is not unusual. And uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes that's what it takes to get to the really wonderful times that we get over and over and over with that. And to go even deeper with this, unpacking the idea of this being for the fun of it. It is for the fun of it. But for me, for me, my main goal in everything I do is to help create a just, healthy, and sustainable world for our future generations of gratitude for our ancestors who have given us this world that we have today. And I don't mean just our parents. I mean of many ancestors and a lot of people have contributed to it. It's a lot deeper meaning and purpose than you know, just having fun or, or something like that. It's fun, and fulfilling that to me is a lot of the fun. So I'm gonna give a quick overview. What I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about the why we celebrate holidays. Pretty much I already done that. Why the Wheel of the Year in particular, um, that's really, um, you know, uh, up to personal taste, uh, what, what people want. And how, do, how does my family celebrate each Sabbat? And, um, and then have a little bit of time for discussion, I hope. So um, I'm, sure I, I'm sure that we'll make some time for that, because that's a very important part. So, um, so as, just as a, as a quick background, holidays give joy to not just us, but to future generations, too. These are very important. I know that, um, that for me, I was raised Catholic, did all the Catholic stuff, I was an altar boy, the whole shot, and in about, you know, I get to be my late teens and stuff like that, early 20s, and I'm like, oh, oh hold on a second, now I'm finding out that this stuff isn't even true. And um, that's, that's a huge long story, I'm not going to get into that, but at any rate, I left the Catholic Church and went into just being a regular run of the mill atheists. I'm not gonna do all this, you know, candles and incense stuff because it's not like there's some god listening to that, right? Why would I do it? I'm just gonna sit around and not do it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna celebrate holidays. I'm not gonna worry about all this kind of stuff. After a while that's boring. I thought it's just boring. I thought, you know what? I like those candles and incense. They were pretty good. And so I thought to myself, what possible reality-based justification could I possibly have for celebrating holiday and doing this kind of stuff? Why? And I thought, I thought, I thought, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I can come up with something, right? <laughs> Our 
ancestors for thousands and thousands of years have been captivated, paid a lot of attention to, maybe with different beliefs than us, and that's fine, at the winter solstice sunrise. In continent after continent, culture after culture, around the world, time and again, we see this. I thought, I feel gratitude for the life that I have, the very fact that I exist. Shouldn't I note that? When would I note that? Just any time I'm going to forget to do it. I'm going to put it on the calendar. You know what's going on? I thought, no. I'll watch the sun, the winter solstice sunrise. I'll watch the sun come up on the winter solstice and just take that one moment of gratitude. That was my doorway. <laughs> I started doing that, and it was wonderful. It was so fun. I thought, I really need to keep doing this, and I kept doing it, I kept doing it, and met my wife, and we started, we added the summer solstice out of symmetry, and, and the equinoxes, uh, which is easy, my birthday's on one of them. And, uh, and, and then we looked at the other ones, and pretty soon we were doing all eight of them, and, and my wife, this, my wife is like, this is just, you know, this, this is the third wheel of the year. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> people celebrate? People celebrate things? Celebrate? <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so that was cool. And, and the main thing that I remind myself, when I'm in those tough times, when I'm in the time of, I got to go get this stuff to make cookies and blah, 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 blah right? Um, I, I think, okay, holidays teach. That's the main point of holidays. In a culture, holidays are one of the main ways that the culture is continued from generation to generation. Holidays teach. And kids are really good learners. They learn from us, and one of the main things that they learn from us is what we really think is important. And the way they tell what's, what we really think is important is what we spend time and money on. Right? Not what we say. Kids don't listen to what they say, what you say. Um, what they, they, sometimes, not very often. They, they pay attention to what you do. And you want to know what's important to you? Look at your calendar. Look at your calendar. What you make time for is what's important to you. And they know that. It, sometimes they know that better than you. Um, so that's a real important reason. What you really believe, what you spend time on, and money shows what you really think is real and what you really think is important. And that's what a culture is. That's what a religion is. It says, what's real? This is your worldview. What do you do about it? Right? This is your ethics, your morals, your holidays, your stuff like that. That's all, that's all a culture and a religion is. What's real? What's important? So, it's easy for us when we think we're going to teach our kids things. It's easy for us to think, oh yeah, I taught them that. I told them that. That's not how it works. Not how it works with kids. Repetition is essential. The nice thing about holidays is they come back every year. You don't have to, you don't have to try to schedule the next time you're going to teach a certain lesson when it's built into your calendar that you do every year. Kids need to see this thing again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Otherwise, they're going to forget it because they're trying to learn all kinds of different things all the time. Repetition is not a stupid, boring, repetitive thing. It's essential to learning what's real and what's important, especially when you're growing up. Don't be afraid to repeat things, especially when you're doing it with the holiday year after year. OK, so, so hold on a second, hold on a second. Isn't this like indoctrination and we should just let them decide and not do any holidays and you know, let them sample all the holidays? Or maybe we'll do a different cultural holiday every year, you know, once this year and a different set this year and a different set this year. Well, with, re with, re with, repet with the problem with repetition, that means that they're not going to learn any of them. And it also means that, that they're going to learn from you that you're not completely sure you know, what, what you think is real and what you think is important. Now, it is true, you know, with the scientific worldview, every belief is tentative. But that doesn't mean we're completely unsure. I mean, we're not, we, we don't know anything for sure in science. We don't know for absolute certainty that the world is round. But we've got pretty good evidence. And, and saying that we don't know anything for absolute certainty is too often taken by anti-science people to say, oh, it's just a theory. Oh, we don't know that, right? We're pretty sure of some things. 
And it's okay for your kids to hear that, it, especially when balanced when, as they get older, with the whole idea of how you learn things asymptotically, getting closer and closer and closer, the certainty of never getting there. So, um, what, if, what, what do we do? If we let them decide, and, and of course they're gonna decide, right? You, you can't let them decide, they're going to decide when they get to be late teenagers. What you're doing is building a foundation. Because if you don't build a foundation, you can be sure that there's a lot of other groups and people who are working very, very hard to build a foundation. Build a foundation based on consumerism. Build a foundation based on, you know, just, um, just, just, pure, um, just pure spending to satisfy ephemeral um, wants. Or um, certainly a lot of cults out there. A lot of exploitative, exploitative type religions. Uh, we could talk about, um, you know, uh, Christianity, of course, but I mean, even on the pagan sphere, there's plenty of exploitive pagan religions too. So, if you let them decide, then you have to think about the fact that that a lot of other groups and people are going to be teaching them because they're going to hear every every day messages from the overculture of what they're supposed to believe, what they're supposed to think is real, what they're supposed to think is important, and especially what they're supposed to do with their lives and with their money. It is an important part of parenting for us to equip them for the real world. And that means that we need to build a foundation where they can have a solid ground to stand on in fun. They're gonna hear I, I hear this from I heard this from my kids the whole time. That that, you know, they're Friends are telling them that if they don't believe in Jesus, they're going to die. And, um, oh, of course, you know, you, you have to go to church, or, you, or what kind of person would you be if you're not going to church? You must be a bad person. They hear these all the time. They hear these every, all the time from, um, you know, kids on the bus, and they hear it on YouTube channel videos, and they hear it on the radio, and they hear it on TV, and they hear it from their friends all the time, whether you, you know, know it or not. So with that in mind, um, you know, we have to take a look at this and say that not teaching them any holidays, not enjoying any holidays with them is not really an option. Like I said, they're going to, they're going to um, have a certain set of holidays. And the groups that are working hard to instill certain values in them know this. They know this very well. This is why there's so much Christian stuff targeted at kids, right from the get-go. You look at this here, they, they talk about the data to plan this out. And the data shows that if they're going to get a kid to be a Christian, they have to get them especially before age 11. That's the plan. So, uh, so that's, that is the world that we live in. Uh, there's a reason these things are targeted to kids. It's important and essential in our world for them to learn critical thinking. It's at least as important to learn critical thinking as it is for them to learn to avoid bacteria and uh, not cut themselves with, you know, uh, the lawnmower by sticking your foot under it or something like that. This is a standard part of teaching a kid to be a fulfilled, productive adult in charge of their own life in this world. And so things like that, learning, learning how pseudosciences work, learning how um, you know, the, the various groups that do this work is important, because otherwise they're going to be targets. <clears throat> any re and at the same time, on the flip side of that coin, any religion can be, health it can be healthy, whether it's you know, Islam or Christianity or Hinduism or paganism or anything, if it's approached from a reality-based standpoint with critical thinking, knowing that certain things are metaphors and not literally real, and that we're doing this to build towards a just, healthy, and sustainable future. But, depending on the religion, that can be harder or easier, depending on what's already in the doctrine. Okay, so I mentioned before what my life goal is. That's why I'm here, that's why I get up in the morning, and it's, that's, a, that's a value judgment. Other people might not share that. But, um, but I want to be open, you know, where I am. Your situation. Everyone's situation is different. A lot of us have very, very different situations, and some of those we have a lot more freedom or less freedom to, uh, you know, to celebrate holidays. When, when, when I started with this with my parents, it was difficult. 
um, it was difficult because my parents were solid Catholics and you know, and they were paying for my college and stuff like that. Um, luckily, it wasn't nearly as difficult as it could have been because I had an older sister who had already decided to leave Catholicism, and this was the big tragedy. And so after that, snowplow effect, right? Um, but, but, but you're not always the one buying the snowplow like I was. Sometimes you're the one doing the snowplowing. So, um, so that can be very different. It's important to recognize boundaries. As a parent, it is our responsibility to raise our kids. It is not someone else's responsibility. And if someone else is trying to raise our kids, especially in ways that are harmful, it is our responsibility as a parent to step in there and say, no, this is the boundary. This is what we can do. I had this talk with my mom. It was a little difficult at first. But after a few years, she came around. And that was great. And it's wonderful when that happens. And I recognize that sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes you might risk the relationship. And it's up to you to say, OK, is risking this relationship worth raising my kid in a healthy way? That's, that's up to the parent to decide. OK, so before I get on to some details of what we do, I think that because holidays teach and because holidays are fun, holidays really lay the groundwork for how we live our lives, how we live our lives in joy, in gratitude, in ways that fulfill us and fulfill those around us, a way to be a blessing and a benefit to the world around us. <clears throat> meaningful, meaningful because you don't want to celebrate a holiday just out of rote because then you're teaching people, including yourself, don't forget yourself worth here, that you're not really in charge and you're just kind of going along with it, right? You want to celebrate holidays that are meaningful that are reality-based for the same critical thinking um, reasons that we talked about a minute ago. We want to do ones that are healthy, that are going to promote mental health, physical health of us, the planet, the biosphere, and especially that are fun. Because if it's not fun, then all the other ones higher on the list don't matter because you're not going to get them done. So, any metaphors, as I mentioned before, you can do this from any religion. I can show why I picked the Wheel of the Year. I, I, I said that, you know, I picked it really starting with the Winter Solstice Sunrise, and after that it kind of kind of all came together. Okay, here's our Wheel of the Year, right? It's wonderful, it's colorful, it's symmetric, it's great, right? It is amazing, the content of this Wheel of the Year when you start to unpack it. Because if I'm going to teach with holidays that are real, if I'm going to teach myself with holidays that are real and enjoy things, then I really need to do ones that help show about this world. Because if the holidays are teaching me about some fantasy world that doesn't even exist, then what good is that for me or for anybody else, right? This wheel of the year teaches so much about our world. Watch this. Our wheel of the year is literally the Earth's orbit. If you look at the Earth's orbit, the Earth is in one position over here on the winter solstice. It goes around a circle to Imbolc. It goes around a circle to Ostara on the spring equinox, right to today, just after Belpain. And it goes around again. If you look at it in space, and say, how does it trace out the wheel of the year? Because we're in the northern hemisphere, that means you have to be looking from the south underneath to see it go in this direction, and vice versa for people in the southern hemisphere. To literally teach about the orbit of the Earth with every holiday. That's what we're doing. Okay, now, <clears throat> again, wheel of the year is the Earth's orbit. If you Take a look at this, we're all very familiar with the fact that here at the December solstice for us in the northern hemisphere, it's dark, equal light, it's light. So that gives us this wheel of the year where the darkest is at the winter solstice, the lightest is at the summer solstice at Litha, and your halfway points go in between. Okay, now, watch this. A lot of us know, a lot of us know, especially people like me with the birthday by the equinox. That you can have a party outside on one equinox and not on the other. <laughs> right? Right? It's a lot warmer 
at Mavon than it is at Ostara. A lot warmer. What? What? <laughs> I thought I thought this was like equal and symmetric, right? What's what's going on? How can that be the case? No. The temperature lags behind by about by about one sabbat. It goes about six weeks later. So the temperature at Samhain is close to Delta. Those are where the temperature is equal. Those are the equitherms. And similarly, right, the temperature is at its maximum at Lunasa, not the summer solstice. Temperature is at its minimum at Imbolc, not at the winter solstice, right? Imbolc is the winter thermstis. Stis is Latin, means stand still. Lunas is the summer thermstis. So we get a second set of cycles, a second set of maximums and halfway points. Hold on a second. How many people were like, oh yeah, those cross quarters, they're just arbitrarily thrown in there halfway in between the other two quarters, so they're not real. No! They got, they got a cycle just like the other one does. Now, depending on your local geography, especially how much water you have around, this lag may be more or less. It's certainly not always going to be six weeks for your location. And that's why it's very important for us, if we're going to teach reality, we're going to teach based on our local climate, right? So you can tune your celebrations. Feel free to tune your celebrations to your local geography. For instance, um, a lot of times at, um, at Ostara, people will be talking about you know springtime bursting forth and stuff like that. I'm in Michigan. At Ostara, springtime is not bursting forth. It is winter time. <laughs> now, the days are significantly longer, but the temperature hasn't caught up yet. And so you want to tune this to your local location. In fact, one year, I walked into the backyard on Ostara morning and sat down, bent down, and tied on my skates and went ice skating. <laughs> so it depends on your local geography. Very different, especially out here in the west or the south or something like that. Yeah, real quick, we're going to hold most questions to the end. You, go, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, you might have to our wedding here, uh, just for the and, uh, two weeks before, and it's <laughs> Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure enough. Yep. So, so if we put these together, then look at this, look at this wheel here. Now, um, speaking of this, I have handouts right here. I have handmade these, and everyone can take some. And, and, and I am serious when I say everyone can take some, right? I've got 75 of them. Please do, they've got... Uh, a wheel of the year on the front, wheel of the year in the back, and space to fill in your family traditions of how you're going to celebrate them. This is this is a nice laminate sheet. You can write on there with dry erase, and you can erase it when you change, because it's okay to change. So please do take these. Um, <clears throat> yes, these cost me two dollars a sheet. Yes, it'd be great if people reimburse me, but do not feel obligated because my goal is to help families celebrate things. And if somebody knows five other families that would be interested, and they take 10 of these, and they can't afford to pay me a cent, that's great. I really, really, really prefer that to anyone not taking even one because they feel they have to pay for it. You do not have to pay for it. These are here for people to take. I'll, uh, I'll they're right here at the end. Um, I'll pass them around. So um, please do take some. Um, for geeky math people, here are the two cycles mapped out as sine waves with, um, that, that I, and I figured out the constants that I need to put in here. For my location in Midland, it's going to be in Midland, Michigan, it's going to be different, different locations. I'm down in Detroit now, it's almost the same. So, okay, that's our real year. It's incredible. If we're going to teach something based on reality, I would be really hard pressed to come up with something that's more inter intricately woven with different reality-based meanings than our wheel of the year. 
So, wheel of the year is the year of surf. I'm going to show you something here that if you haven't realized this, you probably haven't. It took me a long time. It will, it is, a, it, I found it as a huge surprise. I'm like, whoa, right? Okay. Everybody knows this. This isn't the world part is close, though. Everyone knows that the sun is actually traveling through space. Our whole solar system is traveling through space. And so that means that as the Earth goes around the sun, it does not trace a flat circle. It traces a spiral through time. Right? Because the sun is moving. It's actually not even perpendicular. So, um, <clears throat> because things get random out in space. But the point is here that this traces out a spiral. Okay. As we saw, we saw the fact that our wheel of the year is literally the Earth's orbit. Okay? So that means that this traces out the wheel of the year, just like our lives. We come around to Yule and then the Imbolc and stuff like that, and we come around, when we come around to Yule again, we're a different person. Our family's a little bit different age. We're not on a flat circle, we're on a spiral through time because we're in a slightly different place, right? Look at that. Okay, now, hold on a second here though. When we're celebrating the winter solstice, the summer solstice is being celebrated in the southern hemisphere. The wheel is reversed in the southern hemisphere. That means that, just like we saw before, the holidays across from each other are opposites. They're not just opposite in location. They're opposite in meaning. They're two sides of the same coin. They're, they're the other way of seeing the same thing. They're almost the same thing, and they're celebrated at the same time on our Earth on the other side, right? So, like, for instance, people think about Beltane, right? All the abundant life, all the joy, first and forth, opposite. Samhain, when we celebrate and venerate our ancestors and death, right? And we can do that for all of them. People are familiar with this. Now, if I did that and I said, okay, I'm going to remember this here, then when we celebrate one thing, it's the same thing that the, that the other hemisphere is celebrating on the other side, right? So we almost have like a phantom planet over here celebrating the other holiday. If you think about the opposite across the wheel of the year, they will celebrate what the other hemisphere is celebrating when we're here. And they'll celebrate what we're celebrating when they're here. It's like you have two of these linked together by a band across the middle, spiraling through space. What kind of shape might that make? Ah! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> For real? We have trillions of miles of this in our bodies right now. And here we are celebrating the wheel of the year as the planet traces this out in space with a distance of 500,000 miles across. Wow! Now, these holidays are so intuitive, so intuitive because that sun matters. When that, if you're an agricultural society, and everyone was in an agricultural society in the past, right? Or even hunter-gatherers, same thing. That sun coming back really, really matters. There's an obvious reason why it mattered so much to our ancestors across the globe and culture after culture. And that means that we don't just have Stonehenge, but here are stone circles in France. They're all over the place. There's hundreds of them in Europe and on all the continents, other than, of course, you know which continent doesn't have any stone circles? Antarctica, Antarctica right. Um, so, what this says to me, and what it said to me even before I knew that the Wheel of the Year existed, is that celebrations based on reality, based on especially this aspect of reality, because it's so comprehensive of so many different details, are something that unite all humans regardless of culture, race, gender, and so on. This is something that unites all of humanity because it's in all of our ancestors. No matter who you are, this is what our ancestors for years have done. And that's why we have stone circle monuments based on these holidays. Not all of them at the same time, but at least some of them. Here's some in South America, in 
Asia, Japan, and this one here is in Indiana. I highly recommend going to it. Um, <clears throat> great mound, um, just north of Indianapolis. And of course, the medicine wheels out by here. And additional stone circles everywhere, including this one here, this causeway aligned to the winter solstice sunrise in Egypt um, by the pyramids. So uh, another important message, that this is something to unite all of humanity, something that's in all of our past. OK, now let's look at some quick themes and get into how I celebrate them. And you can see if there's any good, in, good ideas in there that you want to um, uh, pilfer. So some quick themes. <clears throat> Other ways that people have seen this in many different cultures um, is, to let, is to map different things onto the wheel of the year. Um, some of these might give ideas for you. Some of them I'm sure you're already doing. Um, stages of life. It's so intuitive to map the stages of life onto the wheel of the year. We already do it without even knowing by putting death at solace, right? In so many other ways. Births, how many people hear people talk about birth when you're getting into late December? Wow, <laughs> right? The whole culture is already celebrating birth. That's not a mistake. And then infancy, childhood, being a teenager or a, or a young adult. People don't always get married when they're a young adult. But most often in our various lifespans, they do, of different people. When do we mostly have weddings? Right here. Right here. There's a reason for that. Mature adulthood, retirement, elder, and of course, death itself. These are important. These are important as rites of passage, too. It's, it's a, a very good idea to have a separate ceremony to mark some of these. Um, and, and, and to do so in a reality-based way is so much more fun and so much more beneficial to everybody. That's a whole nother question, a whole nother uh, topic there. Um, so when we look at, now this is one that, that, that I do, we do in my family, and I encourage it for anybody else because it fits so well with the Cosmology, which I'll talk about later. But that's to map our history from the Big Bang until today under the wheel of the year too. You get nucleus, nuclear synthesis with stars. Stars. We celebrate stars in late December too, right? We do. Celebrate all these different stars making all these different elements. Early hidden life at Imbolc. The first life at a first multicellular life at Ostara. The bursting forth of many different kinds of life at Beltane. Conquest of the land. Big powerful dinosaurs. And, um, and finally, extinctions, endings, and deaths at Zawa. So with that, let's take a look at celebrating the wheel. What I'm going to do here, um, trying to go through these uh, relatively quickly. For a lot of them, I'll talk about seasonal change for themes, human lifespan, deep time history, and other meanings like that. These are themes that you can use for decorations. These are themes that you can do for um, uh, uh, what you do at a party that might fit the theme or something like that. Especially themes that you can talk about with your kids. Um, when you're wondering why you're putting strings of lights up in late December. Because all these lights are all these little different colored lights are the stars. Stars are different colors. If you look closely, you'll be able to see that. <clears throat> And then how you celebrate. One, one thing, of course, decorate, you know, that's important. It's good to see these things. That's what kids see. They see you decorate. They see the decorations up. You see them. I don't know about you, but when I come home and my life and my house has a bunch of solstice lights in the front and I walk in and there's lights and, and maybe a pine scent thing in the room and I walk in, it feels really good. These decorations touch deeper parts of our minds, and, and that's a very uh, important part of being human, I think, to experience that. Spiritual activities, I'm not going to mention on each of these holidays a ritual just because, and we have a ritual, and we have a ritual, right? But understand that we do very often have a ritual for most of these. Um, <clears throat> I set up the, I won't show pictures of my focus or altar because 
I, I would take a lot of time. It'd be, it'd be up for every single one. But we do, we change this for every holiday. Um, and fun activities, music um, is an, another good part of being human. Special foods, very common when we talk about holidays. All of these reflect these. And the best way to teach about these is to have lots of these. Because if you sit here and lecture about these, no one learns anything. So what we have, Yule, um, <clears throat> some of the themes, uh, beginnings, stars, and the Big Bang, uh, supernovae giving the elements. You can see a lot of people have a solstice history with a star on top. Look at this, it's wonderful. And um, <clears throat> here is, I, I will have some images of my ultra focus. Here it is right here. Um, and uh, how we celebrate, very standard celebrations. We have a set of doors that we open, and kids get really excited. You see, look at this, we need to open the door every day. Open the door. And in the door is maybe, maybe, actually I've used this picture right here and talk about supernova, and then another day there'll be pieces of candy. And then another day we might have, you know, things about how sun pillars are formed, or what the star of needle juice is like. And another day we might have both that and maybe some quarters or something like that. Uh, but you just kind of mix it up. It's a surprise every time. And uh, a lot of these you can get with just numbers. And the trick is to come back from solstice, start this, you got started right around after Thanksgiving because solstice is a little earlier, right? So um, you count it back, it works really well. We, uh, we have a person. Um, for winter solstice who hides the stockings on solstice morning. Different person every time. They don't know who it is, but we give them hints often in these doors. And that allows them to start to, now the kids are getting a little older, they just get on Google and they start, right? So we've had to make the hints really hard. Um, because if we give them a, you know, oh, look at this. Uh, Hypatia is the person, right? You can't give them a very good hint. But the kids get into trying to figure this out and it's a really fun family activity. Um, we've had Matt Curie, we've had Carl Sagan, we've had a whole bunch of different people. Um, Harriet Tubman. Um, you can look at what's going on in the country and say, oh, what's an important thing to highlight right now? And of course, the highlight. It's the winter solstice sun. And then we come back after that for uh, gifts, opening the stockings, stuff like that. Uh, a few years we've made Yule logs. Great idea. It's a lot of fun. You can, you can tie them up and put decorations on them and burn them. Um, so we've done that a number of years. We'll take a quick look at In Bulk. Um, in Bulk, the theme. Remember, we're looking at hidden life. Um, we're looking at the fact that life is surviving under the snow. Or, in the case of Earth, three billion years ago, that life is surviving as bacteria underneath a frozen Earth. And if that's the case, then what do we do? We put candles down in the snow like this. You can sink them. You can sink them down in the snow. <clears throat> and we actually let them go out and use that as a fun divination tool to say which is the last one to go out and how long it's going to take for spring to come. And we make it clear with the kids to talk about doing things for fun, and knowing it's not literally real. This isn't going to tell us how early spring is going to come. But it's still fun. And it's still fun even if they know that. Just like the open label placebo effect. We make candles for impulse. Uh, these snow candles are a lot of fun. You just take some snow and hollow out a, you pack it. You've got to pack the snow kind of tight. You hollow out a certain pattern, put the wick in, pour the wax in. Here's ones we've made in different years. Um, Ostara, um, we'll talk about the light that's returning. We'll color eggs, usually with natural dyes. These are all natural dyes, just different plants. Um, and go hunt for the eggs. And, uh, and also, I didn't show it there. Um, we, we also do have baskets. The kids search for the baskets, and there's different, different toys and stuff in the baskets. Um, for Beltane, now we're talking about vibrant light all around us. We're talking about flowers actually coming up here in Michigan. And um, we also plant seeds. We plant, uh, I'm sorry, 
at Ostara, we plant the seeds so that they can start during that time. And then at Beltane, we put them outside. If you're if for Michigan, that's a little early, so sometimes we do it the next weekend just to be safe because of frost. But for most people, it works really well to talk about the life at Ostara planting the seeds and then plant them at Beltane. And you can, you can really see them by then they're bigger than this. Um, <clears throat> And of course, a maypole, things like that. We don't often do a maypole just because um, that's towards the end of the school year and we're really busy, but we've done it a number of years and it's really good. I wish we could fit it in more. But this also brings up the point. Remember when I said before about what's important, just look at your calendar if you're not sure, right? We don't hit all the holidays equally. Um, we certainly put a lot more investment, time, money, and stuff like that to say Samhain, which is probably the biggest holiday, um, compared to um, maybe NASA or something like that. <clears throat> but we do stuff for them and they're still fun. For the summer solstice, now the weather's warm, now we're spending time outside and enjoying the weather, enjoying the sunlight that's uh, around at the height of its power. Uh, we've done the little, the, the Holly King versus Oak King play, that's a lot of fun. Um, uh, to get, get kids into that. Um, done, done a num number of things there. Um, <clears throat> especially things with trees. We try to especially think about trees then because trees are important and if we don't have a holiday to specifically look at them, they might be missed. So we went to Tree Runner Park the other day and that was fun, did a lot of top roping stuff. Um, Lunasa. Lunasa is, um, here's my focus set up for Lunasa. Um, Lunasa is about the productivity of the land. It's about the productivity of what the plants have done with all that sunlight that they've had now. And about the fullness of, of power and productivity. That can include, as we saw before in a human lifespan, mature adulthood. When people really um, uh, often, not always, it depends on the life, but very often in a more stable situation than when they were teenagers. Um, or, uh, the productivity of the plants. We run through cornfields. In Michigan, there's a lot of cornfields, and it's really neat to see how thick these are. We bake bread. We take that, that, um, that grain that's been produced from the sunlight and, and make bread. We also pick blueberries. Uh, we do an early harvest, pick blueberries, make bread with it, and spend time outdoors for Maybod. Um, now we're talking about a harvest and community. So we have a party, I've had a party. I've had an Equinox party at my house for 23 years on the Equinox every year now. Um, it's great, a lot of fun, have people over for that. Harvest from our garden. Um, these are some pictures from the park party. I had a thermal camera and I was showing them that. But to be around other people and to emphasize again how important community is, um, is a central part of Maybach. On, um, in deep time, that celebrates the community between um, animals and plants with pollination and fruit, because that really got going um, well before the dinosaur <coughs> extinction. And that shows that reciprocity that is important to, um, to have a, a productive, happy community. Samhain, Samhain is a huge holiday. Um, because like I said, gratitude for my ancestors is a central part of my spirituality. Um, I have Samhain holiday cards, or ancestor cards, that um, anyone can get online. If you don't find them online by searching John Cleotos ancestor cards, let me know. Um, they're on the links on the um, Naturalistic Pagan site. You can just download and print them. Here they are right here. We, this is the, co the Cosmolis up on the wall. We stick these ancestor cards up for dinner grace. One, put it up there, say what we're thankful for, that's for, for our dinner grace. We have other graces that we use throughout the year. But this one, leading up to Samhain, is how we go through our whole ancestry up until today. Um, of course, we decorate. Decorating for Samhain is fun. Um, have people over, we do pumpkin carving, we go out trick-or-treating and do a lot of things to recognize Samhain. And the neat thing about Samhain, before I go on to Yule, is, um, oh no, I don't need to, it's done. Um, <laughs> the neat thing about Samhain, just like all of them, but especially Samhain, is a time when 
we have an opportunity to teach the kids that this is what we do for fun, and it has this meaning. We do this for fun because it has this meaning. And so, because there's two different names for the holiday, they learn that very well. I say, this is Halloween. We go trick-or-treating for Halloween. Halloween is the trick-or-treating, and you know, it's just looking at some of these themes. The deeper meaning is solemn, and that's why we pay attention to this date, and that's why we connect these all together in our family. So, that is, um, that's our awesome Wheel of the Year. Thoughts? Yeah. I just wanted to mention real quickly that there are instructions for a number of the things that John has um, suggested on the Indian Paganism blog. So there's a thing for an Indian Pagan Advent calendar, for example, um, instructions for how to do a maypole. There's, there's a bunch of those kinds of resources. So if you haven't seen those, that's where you can find a lot of that. And then also on the Naturalistic Paganism site. Yes, thank you, Mark, for mentioning that. And just to drive that very point home, on the handout here on the bottom where you write your family traditions, on the bottom here are reminders of where these resources are, and it has the Ethiopian site right on it. So please remember, if you're like, oh, hold on a second, what, well, how, do, how do I do this? What, what do I make here, right? Just go there and take a look. So, yep. Does that work? Um, yeah. So one of the things we talked about earlier was that I, I struggle with, so I can, the equinoxes are pretty yeah. standard, even here in Colorado. I'm originally from Missouri, yeah. so I'm like, okay, yeah, it's cold, okay, it's spring, mm -hmm. but then uh, offsetting those cross-quarter days, Yeah. do you find, because we just, we've been doing it on dates, and then we're like, oh, this isn't, you know, it's not matching <laughs> up. And, oh, okay, right. <laughs> so, the, 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 the first and most important thing with all of this is to to change what you're doing so that it fits what your family, what works for your family and your local and your local place. I can say that for me, because the cross quarters are the daylight cycle, on those days I teach the kids and emphasize the daylight cycle. I say this is the longest night. This is the longest day. Now day and night are the same length. And I do the same thing for the other ones, for the temperature cycle. When we talk about the cross quarters, I say, I say, look, you guys, it's in bulk. This is the winter thermosis. This celebrates the coldest time of the year. Look how cold it is outside, mm -hmm. right? And and it is in February, freezing cold, yeah. um, late January, and and same thing. So I just remember when I talk about what we're celebrating, I say, I look at which cycle I'm celebrating. Like like around Samhain, I say, look, now the temperature's changing fast. Now winter's coming. You can feel that chill in the morning. Now winter's coming. And that's one of the things that we recognize at Samhain and why we think about death coming. So, so it's the thermal cycle or the, or the daylight cycle. And that's the way that I make sure that I'm emphasizing those. About the dates. In Michigan, the dates, or to my little calculation, are, are pretty close to the traditional ones, but a, but a touch earlier, actually. And if you actually look, the halfway point between the equinox, between the cross quarter ones, is not on the traditional dates either. Okay. So what I would say is do what what works. I use the traditional dates because they usually work. The people, I mean, they're big holidays, right? Like Samhain. Oh my gosh, we're gonna move Samhain to the 26th. <laughs> no, right? Um, so I use the traditional dates because for me. They're pretty close, and they work. And because our weather changes every day, it's not going to be the coldest mm -hmm. day anyway. Um, I mean, just like how cloud cover can change whether or not one night is the longest night or not, right? right. Um, so we go by averages and, and, and calculations and things like that. So again, just do what works. And if you have problems connecting to the meaning to those, remember that you're celebrating the thermal cycle then, and not the, not the cycle of daylight. So, yeah. Thank you. On that, um, I usually consider each of the Sabbaths to be about a week long, and that means that there's always a weekend that's an appropriate mm -hmm. time to celebrate. So rather than you know having to pull things together and do my observation on a Wednesday when I got to go to work right. the next day and you know, all that, 
I just push it to the most convenient weekend. And, you know, the world has not yet kicked me for doing this. <laughs> um, it, it seems like it's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, <laughs> and, we, we and we do that too, especially for the, like I said, some holidays are bigger than others. But the ones that aren't as big will very often use the closest Saturday, just like Mark was saying. Mm -hmm. Yep. I found that as a parent, it takes a lot of stress off of me because we can spread out the activities. It also makes our family feel more satisfied for longer instead of like this big build up into one singular day. And it's also helped really combat like consumerism mm -hmm. because traditionally we celebrate a holiday before the holiday is even shown up. The stores have already changed over before, right? So the craziest example for me is like two days after Christmas, they have all the Valentine's Day stuff up. <laughs> And less stressed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, our family, we've done that every, it's on a Saturday or Sunday, mm -hmm. always. Just whatever one's closest. We cannot shoehorn anything into a school night. Yeah. It's not no. going to happen. <laughs> And that's what, that's kind of, when my kids were a little bit younger and we didn't have to worry about getting up for school and <laughs> right. I was staying home with them, I was like, oh, we're a little bit more flexible with this. But now we've, and we, as we've brought more people into our celebrations, we've just, we've started moving them a little off, <laughs> off of the actual dates. Um, winter solstice, where you, I mean, that's, everybody's usually off of work or, you know, that one we get to pretty much stick with, but... Do you find that you bring in the cycles of the moon, the full moons, the new moons? Um, not as much as I think would be good. <laughs> the cycles of the moon are are great, and I think it, and it would be very good to bring those in too. We do bring those in sometimes, not so much the cycles, but just to pay attention to the moon. Um, I didn't mention it, but um, but because the uh, like like the lunar eclipse, we always do lunar eclipses. We pay attention to those, like we have. Um, just tomorrow. But um, in addition to those, um, I mentioned before that, that, the, that the two cycles lag, right, so they don't match up. If you think about it, that means that all the seasons are different from each other. In other words, when it's equally light in March or September, it's very different temperature, right? So that time is a different time, even though the light's the same. So what's that, what that means is, for us, the best time to have campfires and stargazing is between Lunasa and Samhain. Because then it gets dark, you don't have to wait up real late for it to get dark, but it's still warm enough that you're not going to freeze. That's the time when I remind, when it starts getting dark, but it's not really, really cold yet, when I remind the kids to look at the moon and pay attention to the moon and look at how cool the moon is. It's kind of like the... The, like the moon, you know, the, the time for campfires, moons, and stars, and things like that. Heck, the Perseid meteor shower falls right in that time. And so, um, so yes, we do pay attention to the moon, partly because we have that nice window there when it's dark and not too cold. Mm -hmm. Or like um, when lantern walks in the thing. Oh, yeah. Or when it's shorter. Yeah. The kids are not in the It's awesome. Okay, also with these, feel free to take more than one. If, you can, if you're thinking of other families that would really benefit this, might not have been able to be here for economic reasons or for other reasons, feel free to take five and give them two or something like that. I brought these to get them out to people, especially people with kids. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of little bit of information there, and your book is understandably towards you know, family and having children. Yes. What about those of us who are single, uh, we don't really have an immediate family, and find it find a struggle in trying to practice and observe these just by ourselves? Yeah, uh, that is that is tricky, and 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 for myself, as I mentioned before, I started this. When I was when I was single and didn't have family or anything, um, with the winter solstice to sunrise. So for that, um, I would say to um, certainly certainly celebrate 
you know, when you do a solitary celebration, certainly you can maintain that, and that's fun and good. In addition to that, um, look online. There's a, a lot more connectivity online for people doing this. For a lot of these things, especially the lunar eclipses and stuff like that, there's simulcasts and live blogs where people are talking and, and blogging about it and stuff like that. Another resource is take a look at um, local UU churches and local Cuffs groups. There's um, pagan groups that you can go to even if, even if people, some people see things more as a metaphor and some people don't. They're still useful. Um, and I've done a lot with Cuffs. In fact, I have cards over there that have this wheel of the year, <laughs> this wheel of the year that's on my shirt. It also has the thermal cycle and the outside and the um, uh, daylight cycle. Uh, separate so you can see them. But it's a card that we made for our Cups group and it has this Wheel of the Year on it. Uh, feel free to take Could one. Could you explain like. what Cups is? Oh, thank you, Mark. <laughs> Cups is a um, organization within Unitarian, the Unitarian Universalist Church, which, um, <clears throat> which is an open church that isn't just Christian. Um, and Cups stands for Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans. And it's people in Unitarian Universalist churches who have wanted to celebrate our Wheel of the Year, and they get together and do it. Um, often much more eclectic. You'll have, um, you know, a Dianic Wiccan and someone who's a Satru and stuff like that celebrating together, which is great! And I'm going to put in a plug for the uh, Affinity Group program that we just launched this year. Uh, there are a lot of local groups that are forming, you know, around a geographical focus. So now that COVID appears to be waning, um, there are opportunities to meet in person again and to get together with people of like mind. Um, you know, religions are a communal thing to do. I, I, I do think it's harder to maintain a practice as a solitary. Yeah, and speaking to that, on the Naturalistic Pagan blog, I post every... Uh, just a few weeks before each Sabbat about a list of online, I started this during the pandemic, a list of online celebrations you can go to. And that's great for someone who's celebrating as a solitary or when we have a COVID issue. But in that list, it used to be a really long list and now more and more of them are going to in person, just as Mark says. Nicely, some of them are doing both, which means that anybody for any of these holidays if they don't have other people to celebrate with, can go to that one, celebrate it with people virtually, and and that um, and that's great. Feel free to ask me questions for the rest of the conference. I'll be floating around. <laughs>